Good morning. Welcome. I am Rebecca Davis. I'm the Access to Services Section Manager with the Georgia Department of Human Services Division of Aging Services. We are so glad you're here with us this morning. I want to welcome you to our Older American Americans Month webinar, a deep dive into Georgia's Aging and Disability Resource Connection, or ADRC. Again, we are so glad you have joined us this morning. We're so thrilled you're with us to learn more about Georgia's ADRC. On the next slide, you will see the Georgia Department of Human Services vision, which is stronger families for a stronger Georgia. And then on the next slide, you will see the Division of Aging Services. We are part of the Department of Human Services. Our vision is living longer, living safely, living well. And we support the larger goals of the Department of Human Services by assisting older individuals, at-risk adults, people with disabilities and their families and care partners in order to, to achieve safe, healthy, independent, and self-reliant lives. I want to take the opportunity to introduce you on the next slide to the Access to Services section, which again sits within the Division of Aging Services. Within our section, we have four teams. You'll see those listed here. The first, which has the orange arrow pointed to it, is the Aging and Disability Resource Connection, which you're going to hear all about today. You're going to learn from the experts on our team. We also have other programs, including our dementia programs, our elderly legal assistance program, and the Georgia State Health Insurance Assistance Program. And that uh, those uh, that group is that team is our Medicare counselors, our SHIP team. So on the next slide, you will see a breakdown of our ADRC team. We have a team lead, and then we have various staff on the team. And so that you can see who you will be hearing from this morning, on the next slide, there are photos of each of the team members that you'll see and there, that you will hear from this morning, rather. You will hear from Tori windsor Foise. She is our ADRC specialist and works with our ADRCs throughout the state of Georgia. And then next, you'll hear from Naquan Escort, our options counseling specialist. And last, you'll hear from Ajene Hall, our transition specialist. And all of these programs, ADRC, Options Counseling, and Community Transitions, they fall underneath the ADRC umbrella. So we are so glad you have joined us this morning to learn more about the ADRC and the great work that is being done in communities throughout Georgia. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Tori to frame the ADRC presentation and to provide the overarching information that you need to know to learn what is the ADRC and what do we do? So Tori, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you, Rebecca. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tori Windsor Foise, and I'm the ADRC Specialist with the Access to Services section of the Division of Aging Services. Now, the ADRC is part of Georgia's No Wrong Door system of care. The No Wrong Door system empowers individuals to make informed decisions and to exercise control over their long-term care needs so they can achieve their personal goals and preferences. The No Wrong Door system also expands access to services and supports through a network of agencies that helps individuals and their caregivers navigate the resources they need through a person-centered approach. The No Wrong Door system is housed within the ADRCs and the ADRCs are housed within the 12 area agencies on aging in Georgia. On the next slide, we'll discuss exactly what the ADRC does. Think of the ADRC as an umbrella because there are multiple programs housed within the ADRC. And if you're somewhat familiar with the ADRC, then the first service you probably think of when you hear ADRC is the information and assistance or the information and referral service. In each of the 12 area agencies on aging, there are ADRC counselors who are answering the phone and contacting referrals to discuss available long-term care services and supports with older adults, individuals with disabilities, and their families. 
Oftentimes, these calls result in the completion of eligibility assessments for two of Georgia's programs. The first is the Older Americans Act program, which is funded by non-Medicaid dollars. You'll often hear this program referred to as the Home and Community-Based Services Program, and it houses services such as home deliver meals, homemaker services, personal care assistance, and respite care. Senior centers across the state are also funded by this program. The services under this program are somewhat limited though, so the ADRC specialists often have to add individuals to waiting lists for certain services under the program due to limited funding. The second program the ADRC specialists assess for is called the Elderly and Disabled Waiver Program, or EDWP. Now you'll often hear this program referred to as community care or CCSP in the community. So if you do, then please know that they're referring to EDWP. EDWP is funded by Medicaid. So individuals must meet certain resource and level of care criteria in order to be enrolled into the program, but the program offers many of the same services as the Older Americans Act program does, including home deliver meals, homemaker services, personal care assistance, and respite care. Additional services offered under this program include an emergency response system, assistance with paying for an assisted living, and structured family caregiver, which is when a family caregiver can be paid to provide care to their loved one. There's not currently a waiting list for this program in Georgia. The goal of both programs is to keep individuals out of the nursing home and in the community for as long as possible, if not indefinitely. While the ADRC counselors are discussing programs and long-term service options with individuals, caregivers, and their families, additional needs are often discovered. If the ADRC does not offer the needed service directly, then the ADRC counselor will refer the individual to any available community resources to meet his or her needs. ADRC counselors do this through the use of the statewide resource database called EmpowerLine Pro or ePro. And this database is simply a website that houses the most up-to-date resource information in Georgia. Resources are always being added to this database as long as they meet certain guidelines. And the database is updated annually because as we all know, things change from year to year. By utilizing this tool, the ADRC is able to provide accurate, unbiased resources and referrals to provider organizations in both the public and private sectors to help meet the unique needs of the individual and their families. Now, in addition to the information and assistance or information and referral service, there are actually two other programs housed within the ADRC. Those programs are the Options Counseling and Community Transitions programs, which you'll hear more about in just a few minutes. On the next slide, I want to demonstrate how vital the ADRC and Georgia's No Wrong Door system of care is. So I want you to sit back and take a moment, and I want you to imagine that you or your loved one are in need of care and you're in need of care right away because you didn't think to apply for assistance earlier in your journey because you didn't need it then. Now, you're new to this whole thing, so you're not exactly sure who to call. So, you turn to Google and contact an agency you think can help. A friendly voice answers and explains that they're happy to assist with the services you need for only $25 an hour. Unfortunately, you have to tell the person on the other end of the line that you're unable to afford this because your medication costs are too high. When you ask if she knows of anyone who can help, she kindly says no and hangs up. So, you go back to Google and call yet another agency for assistance. Just like the other, the agency can assist if you're unable to pay but they're kind enough to give you the contact information for another agency who they think may be able to assist you. So you call. To your relief, that agency can assist with reducing your or your loved one's medication costs, but they're not able to assist with the in-home services that you or your loved one needs, and they're not sure who can. So you again turn to Google for help. 
After contacting three more agencies, you finally find an agency who can assist, but the requirements are different than they were at the last agency. Luckily, you or your loved one are eligible, so an assessment is completed for the needed service. Now, although you received the service you asked for, no one really took the time to sit down with you to go over your needs and connect you with the appropriate resources, even the resources you didn't even know to ask for. By the end, you're likely feeling overwhelmed and confused as you don't really remember which agencies were able to help and which ones weren't. This is what it was like before Georgia adopted the No Wrong Door system of care, and it really demonstrates just how vital both the ADRC and the No Wrong Door system is. Specifically, Georgia's No Wrong Door system is important because it provides a single point of entry for information and assistance to not only individuals needing public or private resources, but also to professionals seeking assistance on behalf of their clients as well as to individual and their families who need to plan for their future long-term care needs. The No Wrong Door system also serves as the entry point to publicly administered long-term supports, including those funded under Medicaid, Older Americans Act, Veterans Health Administration, and other revenue streams. This streamlined system where information is easily available and counselors are trained on multiple agencies and resources Assists make the process of obtaining assistance easier and reduces confusion for individuals and their families. As a result, the use of the ADRC's No Wrong Door system reduces Medicaid spending and helps individuals stay in their homes and communities. On the next slide, you will see a listing of some of the ADRC's partners. Because the individuals and families we serve have such unique and specific needs that often can't be met by one agency, the ADRC and No Wrong Door System of Care partners with a vast network of agencies to help meet their needs. For example, the ADRC may refer an individual to both home deliver meals and DBHDD after an assessment uncovers that the individual is struggling with both a physical and mental disability. After referring, the ADRC and DBHDD will then work together to meet the needs of the individual. The agencies listed on this slide are just a few of the agencies that we partner with, but there are many, many more not listed here. On the next slide, I'm going to dive just a little deeper into the types of assessments completed by the ADRC. As mentioned earlier, the ADRC completes a series of assessments to not only determine eligibility for programs such as EDWP and Older Americans Act services, but they also help to identify other community resources that may be beneficial to the individual and their families. First is the triage, which determines whether or not we're meeting the Older Americans Act target criteria for the Older Americans Act programs. Determination of need revised or the DONR measures functional impairment and unmet needs in the activities of daily living ADLs and instrumental activities of daily living IADLs. ADLs address the very basic activities that allow an individual to care for themselves, such as bathing and using the bathroom, and on the other hand, IEDLs are more complex, but they are also important to getting individuals back to being as independent as possible. So think of things like balancing a checkbook, going to the grocery store, managing their medications. The income worksheet is used to drive the conversation about EDWP regarding cost share liability and resources, but the worksheet can also be used to help determine eligibility for additional programs in the community. The Food Security Survey measures food security by identifying individuals who do not readily have access to a sufficient quality of affordable nutritious food. And finally, the Nutrition Screening Initiative, or NSI, takes it a step further by identifying individuals who are at a nutritional risk, regardless of whether they have access to enough affordable nutritious food. For example, an individual may have access to nutritious food, but they're unable to adequately eat it due to having no teeth. So this would place him or her at a higher nutritional risk, even though they have access to nutritious food. Now, 
I'd like to pass the presentation over to my coworker, Naquan Escort, so he can review and highlight the impactful work of the Options Counseling Program. Thanks, Tori, and good morning. My name is Naquan Escort, Options Counseling Specialist with the Division of Aging Services Access to Services team. This morning, I'll be covering the MDSQ Options Counseling and Community Options Counseling programs. MDSQ Options Counseling referrals are received at one of the 12 ADRC locations throughout the state of Georgia through nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities to individuals interested in returning to their own home, their families, or their community. Once the referral is received at one of those locations, the MDSQ is completed, identifying individuals as need or request for MDSQ Options Counseling Program or counseling. The MDSQ or the Minimum Data Set Section Q is a standardized assessment that helps to facilitate care management in nursing homes where the residents' feelings on services, resources, and care management are carefully considered during the assessment and goal setting process. The action plan is a document outlining steps identified by the individual and options counselor to obtain the supports that meets the goals of the plan. This plan is created whether the individual is eligible for a transition program or not. The MDSQ options counselor determines eligibility for a transitions program through various screenings and assessments. And on the next slide, I will be covering required MDSQ Options Counseling documentation. All interactions with individuals receiving services, their families, or their representatives is incident to the DAS data system within five business days of that meeting. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Required documentation completed at the time of these interactions may include the nursing homes transition screening form, the Don R or determination of need revised, and that assessment is required for individuals determined eligible for the money follows the person program. The action plan, which outlines the goals identified by the individual and options counselor designed to assist him or her successfully transition to their own home, family, or community. Some follow ups are to document all the interactions with the individual and the actions taken by Options Counselor to provide up-to-date and relevant information, assistance, and or referral. The risk assessment tool identifies what risks the individuals may incur when returning to their own homes, family, or community. This assessment is required for individuals determined eligible for the Nursing Home Transitions Program. Additional documentation will be recorded as necessary after each encounter or interaction with the individual. And on the next slide, I will be covering community options counseling. The community options counseling program is available to anyone contacting the ADRC who are still currently living within their own homes with their families or in their communities. Individuals' interaction with community options counselors are for various reasons, such as some are requesting information or advice concerning long-term support services. Others may have been referred to the ADRC through a critical pathway provider, such as hospitals, assisted living facilities, and other community-based organizations or agencies. While some individuals may have had a recent significant change in their life situation and need help looking for assistance or supports such as food, housing, and assistive technology. Many of these individuals may have long-term support services needs, but are unsure how to access them or they're just unsure what benefits are available to them statewide or locally within their own communities. So having a community options counselor with the resource database who can alert the individual to benefits and services available to them 
fills a huge void for many of our aging and disabled consumers. This slide, I'll be discussing activities and actions taken by the Community Options Counselors. Goals of the Community Options Counseling Program is to ensure the individual is comfortable with the assistance they are receiving. One way we as professionals try to comfort these individuals and their families is by delivering options counseling services in the settings and by the methods desired by that individual. Some of the various settings options counselors may facilitate these interactions with our consumers include over the phone, their place of residence, medical practice where they receive their care, hospitals they visit, uh, agencies who are currently providing services to them, as well as any other location <clears throat> deemed safe by the options counselor. Options counselors will assist in making appropriate connections to community-based services that may include, but is not limited to, the SHIP or State Health Insurance Assistance Program, who provides medication, I mean, who, who provides education on Medicare, financial assistance such as rent utilities, employment assistance, mobility and transportation assistance, as well as peer support and food security. Options counselors will also assist in facilitating future planning, which is essentially talking to individuals and their families about supports and services possibly needed in the future. Options counselors will also be providing decision supports, assisting the individual in evaluation of various resources and pathways to include the pros and cons of specific options presented to them. Options counselors will also relay language appropriate information to the individual in the language of their choice, making sure to be mindful of any use of professional jargon and confusing and minute details. They will also complete a written action plan with the individual outlining their goals, as well as steps and supports necessary to assist them in being successful and remaining in their own home and community. Just the community supports will also be provided to the individual that will, co co that will coordinate their eligibility determination for each connection or referral made. And a follow-up will be initiated after 30 days of completion of the action plan to determine if the services, resources, and or referrals were successful. This follow-up will also determine if any resources are outdated, ensuring all information and assistance is up-to-date, relevant, and viable. On the next slide, I'll be covering benefits of both MDSQ and Community Options Counseling programs. Both programs are currently being offered to individuals at no cost through the ADRC. Options counselors conduct face-to-face -face visits with the individual, which is great for those experiencing social isolation. Virtual visits are also encouraged depending on the circumstances of the individual. Having an options counselor can also help to prevent a crisis situation by providing the individual with an active ear, <clears throat> as well as a connection to emergency services if necessary. Options counselors are also able to connect individuals and their families to a range of options and services geared towards providing support and promoting a successful and safe transition back to their own homes or allowing them to stay home without the threat of institutionalization. Options counselors also break down online information that may be complex and confusing to the individual and their families, while also assisting them in reviewing and selecting long-term care options. Well, that was my last slide covering MDSQ and Community Options Counseling. I sincerely thank you for allowing me time to present you both my programs. Uh, and Ajane Hall, Transition Specialist, will be up next presenting her content area. Good morning. My name is Ajane Hall. As the transition specialist, my role is to ensure individuals transition home safely through our community transition programs. Money Follows the Person, also known as MFP, and Nursing Home Transitions, also known as NHT. 
Here are a few key factors that differentiate the two programs. MFP, the individual must meet minimum of 60 days in a facility, have Medicaid as a payer source, and enroll in a community Medicaid waiver. NHT, the individual must meet a minimum of 20 days in a facility. Although there is no income resource limit, which I will explain later, the individual must be at least 55 years or older. Both programs provide services 365 days post-discharge. On the next slide, we will dive deeper into Money Follows the Person. Money Follows the Person is a 10-year demonstrated grant awarded to the state of Georgia and is administered by the Department of Community Health. MFP utilizes home and community-based waiver services coupled with MFP transition services to resettle Medicaid-eligible individuals currently residing in inpatient facilities, for example, nursing homes, hospitals, and or psychiatric residential treatment facilities. Participants are eligible through Medicaid waivers meeting criteria for age, blind, and disability, physical disability, traumatic brain injury, independent care waivers program, all between the ages of 21 to 64, in addition to older adults 65 and older. On the next slide, we will dive deeper into nursing home transitions. Nursing home, trans nursing home transitions <clears throat> was established July 1 of 2016. The goal was to provide funds to transition 167 seniors from nursing homes into the community setting. Seven years later, we continue to transition seniors to the community utilizing $1 million per year. NHT is designed for individuals who are 55 years or older. Participants' gross monthly income must be less than the average cost of care for a nursing home in Georgia, which is $9,034. And this is why we say there's no income limit. Our demographics and our clients we cater to typically do not gross an income of $9,034 per month. In addition to the minimum 20-day consecutive stay in a facility, individuals must be a U.S. citizen or show proof of legal status. On the next slide, we will learn the role of transition coordinators. The Area Agency on Aging and Centers for Independent Living will provide leadership in representing the needs of individuals who are aging adults and or living with disabilities. Transition coordinators take on the role to provide guidance and assistance with transitioning participants from the facility setting into the community. Transition coordinators gather documentation, assist with arranging home modifications, locating housing, and overall support to assure participants remain in the community. One example of support post-discharge are monthly contacts. This is designed for the transition coordinators to check on the participants and to reassure that they are remaining safely and acclimating into the community. If you have any questions for any of the programs, please submit them in our Q&A section and we will re review them at the end. I am now going to turn it over to Tori and she will let you know how to connect with the ADRCs. Now that you've learned about the ADRC and the services we provide, we'd like to invite you to connect with and refer individuals and their families to us. So our contact information is listed on this slide, as well as the 12 area agencies on aging who are across the state. On the next side, you'll see a screenshot of our website. So if you'd like to make a referral to the ADRC on behalf of an individual you serve or know, 
then you can easily do this by completing the online referral form found on our website. On the next slide, I'd like to highlight the important partnership we have with DBHDD. So DBHDD employs four ADRC specialists across their six region area, and they serve as our liaison between DBHDD and the Division of Aging Services. So if you're assisting a client who is in need of services through one of DBHD's program, so if they need help with their meeting their behavioral health needs, um, if they have questions about the now comp waiver, and you're not sure you know, who to contact, who to connect them with, or what to do, then please feel free to utilize DBHD's ADRC specialist to help connect the individuals you serve to the appropriate partners and resources. They can also help present or speak or train if you need them. So I just wanted to highlight that. On the final slide, I'd like to highlight how we can collaborate together. So as a member of our network, each of you plays such an important role in helping to spread awareness about the role of the ADRC and how it can support individuals and families in navigating our system of care for older adults and individuals of all ages with disabilities. There's nothing more tragic when an individual transitions out of a nursing home without the assistance they need because they didn't know that Money Follows the Program existed or a caregiver's health suffers from the stress of caring for a loved one because he or she didn't know who to call. As valued partners, we're leaning on you to assist us in our efforts, and we're grateful for all that you do for everyone in the community. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca, who'll lead the Q&A section. Thank you, Tori and Naquan and Ajane. That was a lot of information. As Ajane mentioned earlier, if you have questions, please put them in the q and I'm going to, we'll give it a few minutes for your questions and I'll take a look at the, the q and I did want to mention that the website for Georgia's ADRC is in the Q&A, so make sure you take a look at that. You'll, you'll have access to a lot of information, how to connect to the ADRC, all of that is on the website. So, so team, we do have a few questions that have come in, so I will fill those. Um, Tori, the first is around the ADRC assessments. How much care can be provided to clients under the programs the ADRC assesses for? Absolutely, it's a good question. Um, first, I'd like to say that neither program, the Older Americans Act or ADWP, can provide 24-hour care, and I think it's really important to understand that. But having said that, you know, both programs really look at the specific needs of the client. However, I do want to have a caveat to that. I want to say that the services offered under the Older Americans Act are more limited than they would be under EDWP. So for example, clients may only receive four to six hours of service under the Older Americans Act program, and that would be per service where they could get more under EDWP. But it, that one depends on their needs specifically, but it will never be 24 hour care. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, no, thank you. Okay, I'm looking through. Naquan, we have a question about options counseling. What are best practices for dealing with confusion and friction with nursing home staff referring consumers for options counseling? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I would say initially is to try to build a rapport with the staff. Um, try to make sure that you have an open line of communication. Um, if things are confusing, just try to make sure that you explain it the best way that you can without and, and being mindful of your tone. Um, you know, sometimes we can have, you know, tone and written language that uh, can, you know, make the situation a little bit more frustrating, frustrating on both ends. Uh, but also, if you do experience not being able to make any headways and make use of your uh, your team leads, 
to try to help to bridge the gap in communication. Okay, thank you. As you may, I see a question here. Can a client use a combination of hospital and nursing home days to qualify for a transition program? Oh, that's a great question. Yes. So the answer is yes. Uh, as long as the days are consecutive, it can be a combination of any uh, inpatient facility to meet criteria and eligibility for both money follows the person and nursing home transitions. Thank you. Tori, we have a question about DBHDD services. For DBHDD services, will someone assist the client with, fi with filling out the application? They, when, sometimes is the right answer to that. Um, sometimes they will. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll refer it to like the Family Support Services Program and they will assist. Um, so sometimes they will, but but not always. And I don't think they do it as much as they used to. I think they used to do it more. Um, but I would highly suggest you can send me an email and I'll give you the ADRC specialist over at DBHDD because they may be able to help with that as well. So. And then we had a question, what is EDWP? EDW, it stands for the Elderly and Disabled Waiver Program. So you'll often hear community care or source um, is what you'll hear it referred to as most likely. But it's Georgia's Medicaid waiver program designed to keep people in the community instead of having to go into a nursing home. But the qualifications are different. So you don't go to the Department of Family and Children's Services to apply. You have to apply through the Area Agency on Aging. And because the application has to come from a case manager or a nurse from EDWP, so they refer you. And it can provide you know, quite a bit of care, but it won't be 24-hour care. I hope that answers the question. Sure, and if not, you all please definitely put in the Q&A. So Tori, uh, you and I, might need to tag team a little bit on this question, but it's around uh, services for people living with dementia. Can you tell me how a family would start to receive services for a family member with dementia? Um, how they would start? They, I would have them call the the AAA or the the single point of entry, the one eight hundred number um, on the slide, and hit option two. Um, just to start talking to the ADRC specialist about what the specific needs are and to help plan. Um, we also, when I don't know if you want me to mention this, Rebecca, we also have dementia care specialists um, who might be able to guide if they need more information about dementia. Yeah, I was going to add here in Georgia, we are very fortunate to have some wonderful programs and services for people living with dementia and their families. We have Georgia Memory Net, which is really focused on early detection and diagnosis. So um, Georgia Memory Net, I'll try to see if we can get that link put in the, the Q&A so you all have access to that. We also have a new program, our Dementia Care Specialist Program, where each AAA will have a full-time Dementia Care Specialist who is knowledgeable about dementia programs and resources within the community. So there's a lot of great work going on, and I would certainly echo what Tori said, that going through the ADRC is because that is the no wrong door, that is the, the gateway, the way that you get to all of the resources that we've shared. So definitely start by going through your local ADRC. So I'm continuing to look at questions. Someone asked because of the DBHDD question if they could get your email address again for for the yes, information absolutely. about DBHTD, Tori. Yes, absolutely. I'll put it in there. Okay. 
anything. I want to make sure I don't skip anything. There's several in them. The answer tab. Tori, this is a question you might know the answer to. Where would we start with trying to find out how much funding, if any, would be available if we decided to put our loved one with dementia in an independent living center? Um, are you talking about just like a regular senior independent living and yeah, not assisted living? So that would be, if you wanna know how much care may be available, I would talk to, um, start with the ADRC, but that might need to go to options counseling or case management. But I will say this, you, although 24 hour care is not provided, sometimes you can get creative and you can piecemeal things together. Like maybe you do the Medicaid waiver and you're getting, six to eight hours of care a day, five days a week, and they're a veteran. So then you apply for veteran services and you can get more care. So there's different options that you have to piece it together. So really sitting down with someone to really discuss that and their specific needs um, is really important. So it could start with the ADRC, but that might go over to options counseling for a little deeper dive. So I see a question, would DBHD, DBHDD be where we could start to see if the dementia should be upgraded to Alzheimer's? And I would refer you obviously to um, just the primary care doctor or a neurologist as a specialist. Um, there are other providers such as primary care neurologist that would be probably a more appropriate place to start. And then I also mentioned the Georgia Memory Net. That is a partnership between your primary care provider and specialist who could provide that diagnosis and a care plan. So I'll make sure we have the, the site to Georgia Memory Net also put in the Q&A here. And someone had asked earlier about um, assistance with application. So um, seeing this question about DVHDD, the Centers for Independent Living can also assist with applications if a consumer requests as well. So Tori, you were talking about that earlier, getting assistance from DVHDD, but the SILs might be able to, to help with that as well. Okay. Okay, Ajani, this is a question about transition programs. Does anyone follow up with the people who transition out of nursing homes and into the community to make sure they are safe and getting cared for? And I know you mentioned a little bit about that earlier, if you could talk more about that. Yes, thank you. Uh, so for Money Follows the Person, there is there are monthly contacts each month for the duration of the time the participant is in the program, which is 365 days equaling up to a year. So each month the uh, transition coordinator will uh, give a phone call or set up an in-person uh, time to meet with the consumer just to make sure everything's fine and also providing support in addition to any needs that the client may need as long as it's within um, the realm of their budget. For nursing home transitions, NHT, uh, the policy requires um, six months of monthly contacts. However, there are still um, six months remaining for that client in the program and the transition coordinator will always uh, still be there um, as needed to provide any support or assistance uh, through the duration of the uh, time the clients in the program. Thank you. Going back to we do have the Georgia Memory Net. 
link in the Q&A and someone had asked, thank you all for putting the map back up. Lori, we have a question around the CCSP waitlist. With the waitlist for the CCSP waiver, what is the typical timeline for a client to remain on that list? There, right now, there's not a waiting list for EDWP, the Medicaid program in Georgia. However, I say that, but there's still about a 60 to 90 day delay before services start to get them through the entire process. So even though there's not a waiting list, it's still going to take up to three months to get them enrolled. Yeah. All the questions, see if we have more that have come in. Oh, Tori, I know this is a question that we get quite often um, from people who are living out of state or, or moving, moving here. I am currently assisting a family who was displaced from another state. What can you assist me with? We, it depends on the situation, but I talked to, I actually talked to quite a few families who are moving from out of state to here. So it depends on what they need, but the ADRC knows tons of resources like, you know, financial assistance if they need, um, you know, or even to know where to go, like finding housing maybe if they're displaced. Um, what services are they going to need whenever they get here? Um, those types of things. So there's just an abundance of resources that can help. Um, and I'm happy. I'm happy to help if you need it. Just um, just email me and I'm happy to help you and link you with where you need to go. So but we are just so knowledgeable about all of the resources in the community that are available. So please lean on the ADRC for that. If you're not sure, you know what to do or where to send them or what programs may be available, the ADRC is so wonderful at guiding you in the right direction, listening to what the needs are, even if you don't know what they are 100%, they're really good about pulling those out and just linking you to those community resources, even if the ADRC itself doesn't, you know, do it directly, so. And the next question I think is one that we, we could all take and maybe provide a response to, how do consumers usually learn about these programs discussed in the session? And we've heard of our ADRC being referred to as the best kept secret. So um, there is outreach that is done on different levels, both at the local level, within regions, as well as from the state level to really raise awareness around Georgia's ADRC, the 866 number, the website you see there, you know, trying to, to get that information out to folks. And then, especially at the local level, there are outreach opportunities at different events, such as health fairs and other symposiums that are hosted. So, um, there are boots on the ground trying to get the word out, and then there's advertising that takes place. So, Tori, Naquan, Ajane, anything you would have to add there around, you know, how would people know, how would consumers know about these programs? I'll add, um, outside of outreach, I think, you know, when you're talking to a community as a whole about the ADRC and the programs that are offered, in order to make it memorable, I think if you tell like a story of an instance where someone, you know, was really struggling and needed help and, you know, how it changed their life. I, 
if you've never experienced it, especially the Medicaid program, it is truly life changing. I have seen it. So I think telling like those, of course, keeping HIPAA in mind, so you're not going to say their name, but just telling the overall story um, just helps to make it memorable so they remember the next time they need to. Because sometimes we forget, you know, after outreach events. Hope that helps. And just to follow up, um, options counselors do provide outreach to um, all potential referral sources, um, such as the skilled nursing facilities, hospitals, and community based organizations. So we pretty much try to reach out to people who are, you know, providing direct care. Uh, to our potential consumer base to try to alert them to what kind of services we provide to try to assist in getting those um, to getting out the word. And uh, we also try to encourage word of mouth uh, through the consumers that we do service. Um, you know that if you know that when we are providing optimal service and care that they can go ahead and share that with the people in their neighborhood who may be also looking to receive the same care and services. Okay, great, thank you. So help us get the word out <laughs> for sure. So we have a follow up question, Tori, around the 60 to 90 day window, not not wait list necessarily, but window for CCSP. Based on the 60 to 90 day window to get a client enrolled, is that from the point of receiving the referral? to the service provider accepting the case, or do you mean just moving the client onto the waiver through the case management agency? Moving the client through. So that's once the ADRC sends it to the case management agency, it can still be 60 to 90 days after that. It's a good question. to see if we have any other questions that I may have missed. Again, if you all have questions, please put those in the Q&A. If not, we can wrap our time up together this morning. We're so glad you have joined us and thank you for your questions and your engagement. And thank you team for sharing your knowledge about your programs and information. And check the Q&A one more time. You guys double check me if you see questions I may have missed. All right, I believe we have answered all of the questions posted here. And the, there are some that have come through that I think may have been sent a direct message. So, um, you look, um, okay. I think I'm seeing from all the published questions we've gotten to. So, all right. Well, thank you all again so much for joining us this morning. I'm hopeful that you are leaving with more information about our ADRC and the various programs that are underneath the ADRC umbrella. 
and that you now can share within your network and your families and friends and, and share the good work that's being done here in Georgia. So thank you all for joining us this morning. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Take care, everybody.